in case people aren't here. Um, welcome. I love the, the bird bird update at the beginning of your class. We can do that officially. Um, so reminders for ornithology, right? Uh, chapter eight in Genius of Birds is due on Thursday. I posted the questions. I think I didn't get them up till yesterday, but they're up now. That's the very last chapter. Um, read the chapter thinking about how amazing it would have been if we had been on campus and we were about to start catching house sparrows and song sparrows and doing our behavioral study because it it all kind of starts tying together at the end here. She does a whole chapter that's half on sparrows and I was really excited for it. But you can still observe all these guys. So it's cool if you're able to identify them now and kind of record their behaviors, you can do that from your own house. Um, so read the last chapter um, and we'll talk about it on Thursday. Reminder that they move spring break. So spring break is technically next week. Yay, like I, I don't know what to take from that. Um, no one can go anywhere. Um, but the important thing is that we won't have lectures for that week. Um, I'm gonna get tomorrow posted your field trip kind of outline so that hopefully you can at least spend one day of spring break taking yourself on a bird field trip, even to your backyard if you want to. Um, and then after spring break, we're gonna talk more about the final project that you're working on. Um, Nicole from the library is going to zoom in to talk about finding references and I'll um, give you a better overview of what exactly is expected of you on that one. Um, so, any questions about that? Ninda. Okay. Um, so we're trying to talk about migration. I haven't done like a real lecture in a while in this class. I was really enjoying that we were kind of doing more activity-based stuff, but I do think migration is, uh, there's enough content here that it's worth doing uh, actual lecture on it. Um, and then we are gonna spend some time uh, working on a, reading a paper at the end of class today. So again, raise your hand if you want me to stop and go over something, but since you guys are all muted, I can see the chat if you wanna ask a question in the chat at any point, but otherwise, I, this is what I hate because it's harder and harder to stop and ask questions. I'm just gonna kind of keep going if I don't hear from some of you guys. Um, so why migrate? Um, has anyone thought about why a bird migrates? Um, I hope you know that they do migrate since I've been talking about it. And um, we, the last chapter in Genius of Birds was all about the smartness that it takes them to migrate. But have you thought about why the birds migrate? Does anyone have an idea for why they would migrate? Patrick, what do you think? Um, to find better food resources and more hospitable habitat. Yeah, so like it's kind of an interesting thing that some of them have evolved this thing to migrate and some of them haven't, right? Because we have birds here all winter and then we have migrants that reappear in the summertime. Um, there's all sorts of funny stories um, back in history about people not understanding that birds migrated and what they thought they did, which was like, uh, some thought they buried themselves in marshes and hibernated, um, went to sleep for the winter like a bear, basically, because they couldn't really fathom this idea that all of their birds disappeared and went someplace else. Um, but now we know, for the most part, that they migrate. Kim, did you have a different question? Um, not a question. I just wanted to add to what you had asked. Um, I was just also thinking we know about, like, temperature regulation and energy spent doing that versus doing other things and how they can't really do other things if they're like focused on trying to just stay alive with temperature. It's probably right. a reason why they migrate as well. Yeah, so it's a trade-off, right? Like we, migration is incredibly energetically expensive, but so is staying here in the winter because they have to thermoregulate and keep their body temperature up. So some of them have evolved this ability to migrate, some haven't. Um, so, sorry, I gotta move you guys around so I can see. Um, evolutionarily, basically the cost to migrate must be lower than the cost to stay. So exactly what Kim was just saying, like it's it's too hard to stay. You, you can't make it work here, so then doing this crazy feat of migration makes sense to you. Um, the benefits of migration, uh, insect eating birds need to follow food sources, so up here, they can't stay north for the winter because their food source isn't here. So um, by migrating, they kind of follow their food sources. A lot of the seabirds that travel super long distances um, are doing it also to follow food sources in the ocean. 
Um, so that's like the main driver. But then the big question, um, Natalie, you got a question? Maybe? Um, it's kind of like, uh, well, a lot of species, including humans, like are migratory. So it's kind of like follow where the food goes. And that's what we did until we found that we can like be like produce our own food or stay in one place as long as we can acclimate ourselves to the weather and, and get ourselves through whatever seasonal changes happen. So when it comes to birds, it's just a matter of like, if the ones that can stay here can survive the temper cha temporal changes, temp temperature changes, mm -hmm. but the ones that can't survive the temperature changes will just follow wherever the food goes the same way that humans would do so as well. Yeah, and that's actually interesting because there's certain bird species that have changed their migration based on humans. Like, do you guys remember that part of the Junko movie, right? So like that one group of Junkos in San Diego had stopped migrating, mostly because the humans had changed the habitat so that they have food year round. There's also um, the Anna's hummingbird on the West Coast that because so many people so consistently put out hummingbird feeders, that bird has stopped migrating in parts of his range because it shouldn't be able to find flowers all summer to keep itself, but it can find feeders now. Um, so that's kind of where, yeah, if they adapt like that, they're gonna do fine um, and be able to change and not have to have this trade-off of migrating. Um, the important thing to keep in mind is that migrating is super dangerous. Like there's really high mortality rates during migration. So there has to be this benefit. Um, one of the major benefits that a lot of people have studied is in fecundity. So it seems like birds that breed in the temperate region lay bigger clutches and have shorter time in between clutches than tropical breeders. So basically, if you take all this time to migrate, you're going to be paid off with a bigger reproductive output. Um, and so like we said, they also migrate to exploit seasonally abundant food sources with less competition. Also, especially in the Arctic, um, or Antarctic, the longer day length in the summer gives them more time to forage. So most of the birds are um, foraging during the daytime. And so when the daylight is 18 hours a day, 20 hours a day, they get a lot more time to kind of pack on um, calories. And then there's also been research that there's fewer nest predators and parasites in the temperate region. So it makes sense for you to come up here to raise your young um, because you're gonna avoid some of those predators and parasites. So even though it's really taxing, there's this reason to do it. Um, partially it can be also, like one of the things that's been studied is also that um, there's not enough resources in the tropics for everyone to stay necessarily. So they've, everyone's kind of evolved into these different niches where some are gonna stay in the tropics, some are gonna stay in the temperate, and some are gonna migrate between them. Um, so migration and evolution kind of have a lot of overlap with each other, uh, why, we, why they would have come up with this crazy idea. Um, so um, I'm going to go over some like different types of migration because uh, it, it helps you both be a better birder and kind of understand what's going on around you. So there are both short and long distance migrants. Um, there's not a great definition of what makes you a long distance migrant, but it usually is classified as across continents. Um, we talk about our neotropical migrants here are the ones that are going to go down to Central and South America um, for the winter. So those are kind of our long distance migrants. Short distance um, can be really tricky because some individuals end up going far and some stay close. Once you haven't had it pre-programmed that you're flying to Brazil, there seems to be more variation in how they move. Um, this can be described as leapfrog migration. So the example here is this um, subspecies of fox sparrow, the city is fox sparrow. And you can see they breed kind of far up north in Alaska um, and the top part here. Spotlight. So up here is where they're all breeding and then they come down uh, here to winter down farther south along the coast. But these populations leapfrog each other. So this red population doesn't go very far south. It just goes a little bit farther south. This black population goes south of the red population and the blue population comes down way um, farther south from them. So this is like different evolutionary lineages. It's not that they're all needing to go the same distance south to, for the winter. They need to go 
far enough um, where there's also space. So this population is connected here and probably has pushed these guys farther south and keep going. So that's the leapfrog migration, right? So that they all don't end up in the same exact spot. Um, which is also why when people are trying to figure out how to conserve species and populations, they need to understand the connectivity between these populations. Because all you would know if you didn't know how these populations are related is you know that in the summer, there are fox sparrows here, and in the winter, there are fox sparrows here. This is a year-round population. Um, but you wouldn't know that you needed to keep this, uh, this subpopulation here uh, was connected there. So you kind of want to know who's connected to who so that you can start conserve areas along its range. Does that make sense? Um, so one of my favorites uh, that we're going to see is the gray catbird migration. So um, you look at their range map here, right? They're, they are really widely distributed in breeding season along the East Coast. Um, Non-breeding, some of them go down into Central America. Um, but then there's this population along the coast that's year-round, and that's kind of the area that we're in. So this doesn't necessarily mean that our birds stay here year round, it means that there are catbirds here year round a lot of times. So we don't really fully know if our catbirds are the same catbirds year round or they're ones from maybe upstate New York who come down to the coast to over to spend the winter where it's a little more mild. Um, or if they're doing some sort of leapfrog thing where we actually get ours from maybe the Catskills and then these ones that go down south are from way far up north in Canada. We don't know a lot about them, but it is pretty cool. You can see the catbirds even just on campus all around here. Um, the catbirds will be there for most of the winter. And then if it gets really extreme, it seems like they kind of go closer to the coast from purchase. Um, so they kind of have this more flexible ability to move as they need to um, within some of the populations. And then some of the population is going all the way down to South America and isn't as flexible. So I think they're really cool. I haven't seen one in my yard yet. Um, since I've been home. Um, I hope I get one this year. So these guys um, also do mimicking type things, not quite as good as mockingbirds do. Um, well, in my opinion, that's pretty opinionated, but um, gray birds, little black cap, uh, brown undertail. So if you see one, um, that's a gray cat bird. Another cool kind of story is the um, difference between a hermit thrush and a swainson thrush. So here are the two pictures of hermit thrush and swainson thrush. Uh, wildly different bird, right? They just look extremely different, right? No, they look exactly the same to most people, right? Those that look like brown speckled birds. Um, and you have a hard time, their call is different, so that's the one way you can tell a difference. It's really hard if you're just looking at them to tell the difference if you haven't seen a ton of them. Um, hermit thrushes, it doesn't show up in this picture that well, um, are a little smaller. Um, but the interesting thing about these guys, if you look at their scientific names, right, they're in the same genus, they're just different species, so they're very closely related, but they have really different migration patterns. So the hermit thrush is this kind of relatively short distance migrant. Um, it kind of comes from like high up north and settles into the southeast, and we'll see them in the winter around here occasionally. Um, they kind of hang out down here, and then their closely related relative, the Swainson's thrush, jumps all the way from kind of the same area in the north all the way down to South America and does this really long distance migration. Um, and so the idea behind this is like, obviously they've niche, niche partitioned in some way, right? So they've decided they've split in how they're using their wintering habitat, which is kind of cool. Um, the really interesting thing to me is basically that we can see some evidence of this just in their morphology. So um, we can look at something called the primary projection. So you can see it on this, which isn't a um, thrush, but it's the length of how far its primary feathers project past its secondaries up here. So remember we saw those on an open wing when you guys took your wing quiz, but it's kind of that difference here is their primary projection. And we see that birds that migrate long distances generally have longer primary projections than ones that migrate short distances. And this is something that if you had 
a hermit thrush and a Swainson's thrush in hand, you could actually measure to say, look, this has got a really big primary projection. I'm pretty sure it's a Swainson's thrush, which is why this guy um, is able to migrate that far. So those birds that looked really similar actually have some major adaptations morphologically that make them able to migrate or not migrate. Any questions about that? Oh, I lost my chat. They haven't banned it. There is some, are you talking about gray cat birds, Natalie? Yeah, there's some data on it. Um, there's some cool, we might read the paper on Thursday, um, uh, some cool um, studies. On yeah, that. I was, I was curious because when we, I, if you could go back to that slide, um, uh, like if they ban them, then they would be able to tell maybe like the lower parts like around Louisiana, Texas m might be more likely to go down to the Yucatan Peninsula because mm -hmm. that would make more sense than uh, popul and then populations from New York and Canada would come down towards Florida or something like that. I, and so I was curious if they've done like banding and things like that to monitor where certain populations would travel. They have definitely. I don't think anybody like uh Gray catbirds aren't of huge conservation concern, so there's less research on them in general. But I know I found one paper when I was looking into it um, that we can read. Banding records, and we're going to get to this in the end, banding is really hard because it means you have to then recapture the bird in the Yucatan to know that it went there. Right, um, and so right. we're going to talk about more methods that can be better to kind of understand this. And I'm pretty sure I read a geolocator study, which we'll get into, um, okay. that can get at that better. Okay. So everyone gets the difference in morphology between these very similar species, right? Um, keep an eye out for them any day now. We saw a hermit thrush this time last year, I think, on campus. So um, they're around. So we talked about short distance, long distance. Within the short distance realm are kind of the elevational migrants. So these are ones that move up and down the mountain based on um, time of year. So they're not moving long distances across land, but they're avoiding the harsh winter in the mountains. And some of this can be um, very yearly based on they're just trying to avoid that cold. And some of them actually do a pretty big jump down into the nicer land. So um, this is kind of the same reason that birds migrate in general. So these are two pictures of Rocky Mountain National Park in the winter and in the summer. So it's a lovely place for birds to breed in the summer, but quite unhospitable to them in the winter. So all they have to do is move down slope um, and that allows them to survive the winter. Um, one of the cooler things that has been studied is differential migration. So this is that different age classes and sexes may migrate differently in a bunch of different species. So the dark-eyed junco is one of the leaders in being studied for this because uh, for all the reasons we watch that dark-eyed junco movie, they're really easy to study and a lot of people have been doing it. We know so much about them. And what they found is that adult female um, juncos, so these are a northern breeding bird, right? They, the adult females migrate to the southern U.S. Young male, adult males and young females winter at intermediate latitudes. Um, and then young males winter super far north, closer to where they breed. Um, so can anyone think of why this would be? Why would they do this? It's almost like a leapfrog migration, but the sexes and ages are distributing differently. So why would this happen? Why would some of you move farther south and some of you stay north? No idea. Well, I'm guessing that the female. Unmute yourself, Natalie. Say it again. I'm guessing that the females need the largest amount of like food material more than more so than young males who are like kind of useless at that point. And then uh, young females and adult males then need like the most, like maybe moderate amount of food. And then, but the primary like focus should be the adult females. Those are the ones that need the most resources more than anybody else. Yes, and it's that plus. So the, the actual reason behind it um, is that, so the, 
the young males are trying to get to their breeding territories first because in general, young males have very poor breeding success their first year. Um, and partially that's because they can't set up good territories. So they're trying to be the first to the breeding grounds um, to get a territory before the more established males get there. Um, but it's kind of a trade-off that they might not survive that first winter because they're staying in a more harsh area, um, but they're willing to kind of risk it in the hopes that then they will be able to find a mate in the following breeding season. The females don't even have to rush to get there um, so that they can go farther south because once they get, they let the males get up to the breeding grounds first, establish their territories, and then they follow a few days or weeks later um, so that they can go to get that better food sources down south um, and then get back up to the northern breeding grounds a little bit later and just choose their males from there. Um, kind of after the males have kind of sorted themselves all out. Um, Is there a reason that they have no reason to rush even though young females are closer? Um, I think because in general um, the females are getting to choose. Uh, that's kind of how it works. There's usually enough space for females to set up a nest. That's like the limiting factor. Um, so young females also, I haven't actually known, I would assume it's because um, just migrating your first time, it can be slow anyway. So you stay up north and then you end up getting there um, around the same time as the more experienced females. Okay, and then, so we did short distance, long distance, uh, elevational, uh, differential and not eruptive migration. So these guys are super dramatic, irregular migration. So they don't have any sort of defined path. Um, but then the birds move to area, areas that they aren't typically found. These are usually just tracking food sources or favorable weather conditions in general. Um, so instead of being like, I go from Canada to Guatemala, they're just saying, I'm following the food. And so we usually see them as kind of these random events. Um, with no defined migration path. So the, the very famous one is the snowy owl. So this is a um, Arctic and boreal breeding bird that then during certain food years, uh, when it can't find food up north, has to kind of erupt into our area. And they're also gorgeous. So birders track these guys down like crazy to go see them. Um, and you can kind of see um, this data of where they've kind of popped up, they go to the coast, right? So they're able to still hunt and find generally mild climates on the coast. So you see them on a lot of beaches and stuff. Has anyone seen a snowy owl? All right, well, they're really cool. And you're, you're in range uh, next winter to kind of see one if you keep an eye out for it. Um, I made it my goal to never chase a snowy owl because I always felt like if you chased it, you'd never find it because you'd get a report like there's a snowy owl at this beach and then um, not be able to find it. And so last Christmas, I was really happy because I was at my parents on Long Island and I took Ben for a walk on the beach and then there was a snowy owl at the end of the beach at the end of our walk and it was really cool, but I didn't have binoculars. But either way, um, they're really awesome birds to see and that's why there's so much data on them. People really try to go see them um, when they're around. But again, they're just following food sources. It's not any sort of, you can't be sure you're going to see one in any given winter, which is kind of why they're a treat when you do get to see them. So then the, we also have birds that migrate during the day or at night. And so the diurnal ones, we've already talked about a lot of these guys, um, which are the hawks, right? So they're going to migrate during the day, mostly because they rely on those thermals. Um, so can anyone explain to me like what the thermal is and, and why they're using it from our flight lecture? The thermals meaning like the, when they're soaring, right? Using mm -hmm. the thermals to rise up and then glide down. So they use minimal energy to mm -hmm. go places where they wanna go. Yeah, and do you remember how the thermal is created? What is it exactly? Oh, somebody raised their hand. Tiffany, do you remember? Yeah, so isn't the thermal when the sun is like beating on like pavement and it creates just like a heat vortex and they kind of use that to soar around and they go up super high? 
Yeah, not necessarily pavement, but it's the sun heating the ground and then that warm air is kind of floating up and that's the thermal that they're riding in, which is why they can't do this at night. They hardly ever fly at night because they're relying on that sun kind of pulse to kind of create these thermals. And then they do exactly probably what you guys remember, which is like they, they circle up one thermal, glide down to the next thermal, circle back up, glide back down and keep doing that on their whole migration path. Um, so that's what hawks do. There's certain birds that um, like swallows uh, really need the food sources that are available during the day. So they're gonna travel during the day so that they can eat kind of as they're going. So swallows are aerial insectivores that um, hunt uh, flying insects basically everywhere. So they kind of do that as they go. Um, and then throughout that you have the soars and the non soars So like all the hawks are generally gonna follow this soaring attitude, which is very little um, energetic expenditure, while the non soars actually have to power flight, which is why it's much more important that they are able to stop and get food along the way. So contrast that to the nocturnal migrants. So these are almost all the warblers, thrushes, and vireos. These are the guys that start about a half an hour after sunset. So um, remember that German word, uh, Zugenru, my favorite word, which is migratory restlessness. That's when they'd notice that birds kept in captivity after sunset would start getting really restless because that's when they're about to take off. That only works obviously for nocturnal migrating birds. If you're a diurnal migrant, you're not gonna get restless at night because that's when you're settled down. Um, but nocturnal ones are gonna start to get restless because they wanna take off about a half an hour after sunset um, to kind of fly through the night. So the reason a lot of them migrate at night is to avoid predators. So a lot of the small songbirds are gonna do this so that they can't get picked off by hawks and things that can hunt during the day. Um, a lot of them also use it because then they can spend time during the daylight hours foraging once they stop over somewhere. Um, so there's kind of trade-offs and pluses and minuses to both. Any questions about that? Okay, so the idea of migratory flyways has kind of gone out of vogue in a lot of ways because we're finding that it's much more intricate than these kind of uh, not very detailed maps. But I do think it's interesting to kind of see that this is happening um, not just in our, on our side of the world, but that there, there's these major flyways connecting all the continents basically. So we think of them as in general, you kind of migrate down the East Coast and head down here, migrate down the West Coast and head down here. Um, a lot of the birds from Europe have to fly over the Sahara um, and winter down in Africa. Um, these guys are going up to like Russia area. So those are kind of the major flyways. In North America, see, ours have gotten you more complicated the more you study it. They thought it was just three for a while. Now there seems to be a whole bunch of different flyways. So in general, it's important to know that the birds are funneling through areas in general where um, it's easier to fly, especially for raptors. They kind of follow similar paths and that makes up a flyway. Um, but for some of our uh, smaller songbirds, they follow this path, but really they're looking for good locations to stop over in between. Um, and they're kind of making their way that way. Um, so how birds prepare to migrate is also a pretty um, crazy endeavor. Um, this example of the eared grebe, I just read about this and it, it kind of blew, blew my mind. So this is just a small, um, uh, mostly like in, what word am I looking for? Invertebrate eating birds. So they're, they're like a duck that eats mostly invertebrates. Um, these guys, they studied them. So they, they're fully changing their body to get themselves ready for migration. So an ear grebe doubles their body weight from under 300 to about 600 grams in preparation to migrate. Um, during the fall staging, um, they, to put on fat, they actually have to double the size of their digestive system because they're eating mostly like little brine shrimp. And so they need to eat a lot and kind of process a lot of it to put on that fat. And so the trade-off to double their digestive system, so just have more guts basically, is to reduce their pectoralis muscle. And they actually become flightless for a short amount of time where they're just in the water trying to eat as much as they can. They don't have very strong wing muscles. In that time period, they also molt. So they do, instead of a slow molt that um, 
we talked about in general where they can keep flying, they're just gonna do a catastrophic molt, um, be flightless, flightless for this period of time. And then once they've molted and they're in their good feathers, they then fast for two to three weeks where they shrink their whole digestive system back down, they reduce the size of their leg muscles, increase their pectoralis muscle back up, and even increase the size of their heart. So all of that's happening just to get ready for fall migration to take off. Um, so I think that's fully insane because the idea of going through that much uh, physiological changes in that short amount of time and then doing it every year um, is pretty crazy. So the important thing in all of this is the role of fat. So fat is the ideal fuel for birds as they're uh, migrating. Um, the amount of energy released per gram is twice that of carbohydrates. And everything about birds is to minimize weight, right? Because they need to be able to fly and power their flight for a long time. So they don't want to be heavy. So they want this super nutrient dense, uh, energy dense um, fat, basically. So the other nice thing about fat is that it can be distributed under, around their body, under skin, and in all their cavities. So instead of having um, a huge stomach or something full of food, they have this even weight distribution kind of throughout their body um, for flying. And um, metabolizing fat produces water as a byproduct, which really helps fight against dehydration when they're going through that really energetically taxing um, migration. So they're actually getting water out of their fat as they burn the fat. So usually on any given normal breeding season or wintering season day, birds have only about 5% fat deposits of their full body mass. Short distance migrants are gonna put on maybe 15 to 20% fat, but then the long distance migrants will put on 50% or more of their body weight in fat. Um, that eared grebe was doubling in size, right? So that's, that's a lot of fat on a not very heavy bird. And so this is where we can actually see it. Those of you who got out banding with me knew that I was doing a lot of blowing on the birds um, to kind of look at their chest here. Um, partially that's to check to make sure they're in good body condition that their pectoralis muscle has, uh, looks healthy. And then part of it's to check for fat because part of the place that they store all their fat is in their furcular hollow. So kind of where all of their uh, pectoralis muscles come in on their breastbone under that is where a lot of fat gets stored. And so you can kind of see it in this picture here. This is a big glob of fat. Um, this looks like uh, this is on his belly. So that's his tail end. Um, so they kind of fill in this kind of orangey fat all around when normally you would just see pink muscle on these guys. Okay, so the important thing that I want you to remember is that fat is not fluffy birds. So right now on a day like today, if you're in some of these areas where it's snowing, we're gonna see these super fluffy birds. Um, that's not necessarily them being fat, right? A lot of the birds that are up here right now, like chickadees, hardly ever put on high amounts of fat um, because they're resident. They're not packing it on to migrate. Um, what are they doing when they, when they look like this, if they're not fat? Who knows? Staying warm. They're staying warm. So what do they do to stay warm? They fluff up their downy feathers and then they just poof around. Yeah, so they fluff up their feathers. They have muscles on their feathers so they can fluff them up. A lot of times they literally like pull their head in, sit over their legs because they're trying to minimize all heat loss at this point. But that doesn't mean that they just like gorged on food the night before and got fat. It just means that they're fluffy. It's a different thing. You really wouldn't be able to tell a fat bird unless it was in your hand um, to kind of see some of this because the feathers hide everything which is also the reason that when I'm catching birds, I'm really careful to check them carefully for how healthy they seem before I kind of go on with everything that I'm gonna do, especially if I'm taking a blood sample or something, because their feathers hide a lot of you know, bad things that could be happening to them. And so we have to kind of check under their feathers to make sure they're in good body condition. So, um, I mentioned this in general, but the, the idea of stopover sites for migration is really important. When we talk about conservation, we usually talk a lot about like, oh, breeding ground conservation or wintering ground conservation, but it's actually really important as well that the birds have a place along their migration path to touch down, rest, and refuel. 
um, it needs to have both good habitat for the individual bird and plenty of food so that it can kind of tank up really quickly and get moving again. Um, usually a lot of these places tend to concentrate predators as well because a ton of birds are stopping there. Um, so they wanna be able to get on their way quickly. So it, what a good stop oversight varies on the species. So some birds are gonna prefer wetlands or salt marshes, some are gonna need forest. Um, so this makes it really hard to identify and protect, but is really critical for bird conservation. So you'll hear this in certain, especially when you go to like parks and, and different places, they'll talk about the importance of their land as stopover habitat for migrating birds. Um, a lot of times wetlands, so like the Florida Everglades and uh, Delaware Bay, we know those as really important stopover sites for large amounts of wading birds where they can just take on a whole bunch of calories and kind of keep going. But you shouldn't also just think of it as marshland. Even a place like Central Park can become a really important stopover site. So if you're a little warbler who's moving up the East Coast, you're hitting a lot of uh, impervious surface and urban area. And then you're gonna see from the, the sky, this green spot. And so that could be a really important stopover site for you. And so it is important, we, we talk about conserving huge tracts of land out west and you know, preserving this native forest. And I do you know, think like, but we should also be conserving our local parks and things because they can be equally important um, kind of mini habitats for this stuff. So stopover is kind of a natural thing. They have to stop and take on food every once in a while. Some of the bigger birds can fly longer nonstop, but a lot of the smaller birds are gonna stop and take on food. Um, there's also something called a fallout event, which is a very exciting thing to kind of get to see. So in bad weather, birds in the middle of their long distance fight, flights may get grounded for either hours or days. So basically if they, the winds change and they're now dealing with like a heavy headwind or a hurricane's coming or something crazy is happening, they'll fall out. So instead of migrating over you, they will stop in your area and get stuck there. Um, birders love this because it means that you're gonna see all these birds who shouldn't ever be in your area potentially stopped. Um, and you can see something that breeds up in Boreal Canada will get stuck in Central Park and they can go and see it. Um, one of the coolest events that I've seen photographed was this little island off um, the coast of Maine. So it's all the way up by Canada in the Bay of Fundy area. Um, Machaya Seal Island is what it's called. So you can see the aerial photograph here, like not a big piece of property, right? It literally just has a lighthouse on it. And during a bad weather event, the people at the lighthouse recorded um, one evening just all the warblers that were making their way to Canada stopped off on the island because we, probably a lot of them actually died <laughs> over the ocean, which is sad because these guys were not in great shape when they got there. And so they were not ready to take off again into bad headwinds. So they got these really wild pictures of all of these really kind of exotic looking warblers, which you never see like this side by side, just waiting it out, just trying to wait um, for more favorable weather. Um, so really interesting. Interesting, exciting, but very bad for the birds at this point. Because you think about the proportion of them that found this island to stop off and the proportion that didn't and hit really bad weather in there. Um, it's kind of sad. Okay, so now this is more of a little review moment because we did this in the Genius of Birds um, last week. So I thought she did a really good job of going over the different types of navigation in that chapter. Um, so can anyone explain any of these things and, and what they have to do with migration? These are all the different um, things that birds use to migrate. Um, well, there's the visual markers such as like, um, they were talking about with the smaller bird species um, towards the later end of the chapter. I forget what it was, the hummingbird, that um, among a huge field that the bird could still pick out where that one flower was. Um, so these visual markers like mountains, uh, large trees, the same thing with birds that are looking for food areas. Um, to kind of triangulate between trees and then there's the sun compass so they can 
find where like they are based on like the direction of the sun and monitoring that star compass they can determine where the northern star is um i was kind of confused with the geomagnetism because she went into it and it was like a because I wasn't here for last class, the geomagnetism, because they were kind of talking about it in like a couple different lenses and how different parts of it mm -hmm. were affected. And it seemed like it was a multiple source based thing. Yeah. Does anyone else remember about geomagnetism, what we learned about it? What is it in general? What are they, what are they sensing? Magnetic fields of the earth. Yeah, they're able to sense the magnetic fields of the earth. Do we know exactly how and where they do this? Well, she was saying specifically in the nasal cavity, but that was like not, well, well, it was like shown that if they severed that connection, that that did have an effect, but it didn't seem like it was the only Yeah, so place. I think that was, Pat, was that your question, the trigeminal nerve last time? So they know that if you sever this certain nerve that goes from kind of the head, front of head to the brain, um, they, they can't geo, they can't use their magnetic field anymore, but they don't actually know what organ exactly it is that's sensing um, the geomagnetic fields. They haven't figured that out yet. They keep thinking it needs to be potentially some like iron rich area, but they keep kind of going in the wrong direction with it. So they don't actually know the exact sense organ. So they, they haven't yet put together even an idea of what they're seeing are they feeling it are they seeing it you know like it, it's kind of still a big unknown thing but we know for sure if you mess up their ability to um sense this wherever it's sensed um they don't migrate in the right direction um so it is kind of both unknown but also known it's not it's not that we aren't sure if birds use it we're, we're like pretty sure birds are using it it's that we haven't quite isolated where exactly um, they're doing it from. And then um, odors and infrasounds were kind of similar in general. Or, well, not really. Odors and infrasounds were like just a different map, right? So you could have a visual map or you could have a map of smells or sounds and that's helped you navigate. Most of the times those were kind of towards the end of their um, travels where they'd be maybe navigating by stars and sun and geomagnetism. And then once they get closer to their end point, they start focusing in on actual smells and sights and sounds and things like that. So um, we talked about how basically all of this has to come together for a bird to fully um, be able to migrate. And that's a, a level of high cognitive processing to be able to integrate all of this together is a pretty big deal um, where scientists for a long time were trying to isolate the one thing that they use and it's really clear that it's not just one thing it's all of these things together which should be another reason why we think that they have pretty high um intelligence the other thing i was i was very confused about was the amount that they were talking about the odors because as like somebody who's worked with birds for so long i've actually like they said like you know previously a lot of scientists thought that birds couldn't really smell things very well and i kind of still believe that for so long because they don't really seem to be offended by a lot of odors or mm -hmm. and that was like a big thing that supported that in my own experience with birds is that they lack an offense to it they do get stimulated by certain odors which is what they test in the lab but um to pick up on such mild smells from such far distances that's what was kind of like confusing for me in the book how they would mess with their magnetism but then drop them off miles and miles away from somewhere and then all of a sudden if they couldn't smell over an ocean like where their island was supposed to be that that still limited their ability to get to where they needed to go. Yeah, and I think a lot of it is that um, there's variation within taxa because we still don't think that a lot of the taxa smell that great, but we know that certain taxa smell amazing, like uh, turkey vultures, right? We know that they have an amazing sense of smell and that's partially how they hone in on dead prey to eat. Um, a lot of the birds on like seabirds, the tube nosed birds, they have an amazing sense of smell because that's how they're keying into different sources of fish prey. Um, so I think it just varies. So if you're 
familiar with birds, like songbirds also, I think don't have a super highly, uh, I'm sure they can smell, but not in the way that like we think of our dogs smelling or something like that. It's not at the same level. Um, it just varies a lot. I think it, it was a disservice to birds that for some reason it came out that no birds smell a while ago. Like that was partially the problem that they're fighting against is like actually being like, well, no, some of these birds smell really well and that's how they're navigating. Um, and maybe they don't all use it that way, but in general, cause I would, I still tell people because people will ask me if I'm doing like nest searching or nest surveys, like, oh, you can't touch a baby bird because it's parents will smell you on them and abandon the bird. And that's pretty much an old wives tale. It's not really true. They will abandon because of a huge amount of human disturbance, but it's not your smell on them. That's not what they're worried about. Like the smell of their baby is going to overwhelm that. And they don't, key into that as much but they will abandon based on research or interference so I say I like almost let it be this thing that parents tell their kids like yep because no kid should be messing with a baby bird nest Um, and if it's because they think they're going to smell them on them more power to them you know but I don't think that's the thing that they're picking up on okay good so I'm not going to do more lecture slides on this because I feel like we kind of went over it and she does a great job in the book Um, Any more questions about navigation on migration for these guys? Okay. So now I want to kind of get into the nitty gritty of the science behind how we track migration. So there's a ton of different technology from low tech to very high tech on how we track migration. So I'm going to go over each of these and um, hopefully get to show you guys some videos if it works on different things. So the, one of the first ways to track migration is through just migration counting. So um, this can be, this in a lot of ways is the oldest form of tracking migration because all you need to do is sit somewhere and look for birds flying past you. Um, it's really big for hawk watching because like I said, the hawks kind of all funnel through the same area a lot of the time. So if you are set up in the right area where all the hawks are passing through, you can get huge amounts of um, numbers of birds passing over. So Greenwich Audubon right by school, they do a hawk watch every fall and they get thousands and thousands of birds kind of funneling through their area. Um, There's also Hawk Mountain in um, Pennsylvania that does a big hawk watch. Um, And so those are kind of long-term established ones that every year they're counting how many birds fly over them. They can also be done though for more of a local short-term environmental impact assessment. So people get hired for these all the time to monitor um, a place where they want to site a new wind farm. So usually wind farms, right, are in windy, kind of ridgy areas, and it happens to be exactly where birds want to also migrate through because they're going to follow those wind currents. So um, there's a lot of work to figure out, well, what birds exactly are migrating through here and what densities are there certain places that they don't pass through as much. Um, And so any company that wants to go in and put up a wind farm is usually going to do some sort of bird census to understand where the birds are passing through in that area. Um, And then because a lot of these birds like hawks are easy for people to see, we can also just use eBird and citizen science data to track migration because people are out looking for birds all the time and they can kind of give some insight into where the birds are. So, hang on. Okay, hopefully you guys can hear that. Can you hear that? Okay, cool. So this is from Hawk Watch International, which obviously they study all hawks. Um, this one's down. Each year, an aerial parade of hawks and eagles travels the north-south path of the Manzano Mountains. Hey, I'm getting ready to release a adult sharpie. One, two, three. And each year, Hawk Watch staffers and highly trained citizen scientists devote days on end to the study of those raptors passing blinds like this one all up and down the mountains of the inner west. The raptors fly those ridge lines to use the updrafts and ease the amount of energy they need to migrate. The mountain chains essentially create friendly travel corridors for them. Mazzano's project uh, is 
our second longest running raptor migration monitoring project in our network. And Hawkwatch International operates the world's largest network of those type of monitoring sites. The Hawkwatch crew will identify and count birds as they pass by, but they also use a netting operation to capture some of the raptors. The purpose of the project is primarily uh, to collect scientific data uh, both observational count data and trapping and banning data. While the bird count is important, it doesn't provide some of the information that can only come from a captured hawk. Each netted bird gets measured. Measurements of its claw size, its leg length, the width and length of the feathers. They'll even record eye color and body fat levels. And of course, each captured bird gets a metal reminder of its visit, an identification band. The bird's brief up-close encounter with humans includes almost every test and measurement imaginable, short of asking the bird to turn its head and cough. I like to think of it as a, as a uh, kind of preventative medicine or like an annual checkup that you might have with a doctor. Uh, from this effort that, that we're talking about now, we can learn some things about the trends in raptors. Uh, you know, if a species shows a significant decrease over time, then we need to enter into uh, some applied research to find out what the causal factors are. Hawkwatch research in recent years has drawn attention to dwindling numbers of American kestrels. Their work has also drawn concern for the fate of the golden eagle and ferruginous hawks. We and other organizations that do uh, similar counts have seen uh, significant declines at a continental scale over uh, particularly the last five years, but starting almost 10 years ago. We don't really know why. That's why we need to do more conservation work once we see that that's a red flag. Uh, but at least, we're, at least we're getting it this information proactively, um, you know, much ahead of the curve where we could do conservation work uh, before a species is imperiled. In, in addition to counting and banding birds, Hawkwatch works on conservation efforts for raptors and works to identify exactly what threats the birds might face. That includes consulting with industry about things such as wind farm and pipeline placement and public education about raptors. That includes hands-on, up-close education for anyone interested enough to hike to the blinds in the Manzanos. Hawkwatch has had the benefit of many Share with Wildlife grants from the New Mexico Department of Game and Fish over the past 30 years. The Share with Wildlife is a program that's dedicated to funding wildlife in need. So it provides sources of funding for wildlife work that are not available for other sources. Share with Wildlife began as a checkoff program on tax returns, but has grown with revenue from wildlife license plates and private donations. The grants are not large enough to fund big programs on their own, but they can provide vital supplemental income for efforts like Hawkwatch. And with the need to virtually live in the wilderness for more than two months and the hard work every day, Hawk Watch staffers obviously aren't in it for the money. It's not something you do to get wealthy, definitely. It's something you do because of, of a passion. And you can see that in the people when you get out there. A lot of them have done it for multiple years and have experience and uh, uh, can really share some neat things that they've experienced with you there. And what they have to share can help preserve entire species of hawks and eagles. Hawk Watch is performing a difficult, long-running dedicated job that is really for the birds. Okay, so um, that, yeah, that hawk watch thing. I love that the way you release raptors is you just throw them into the air. Um, it's one of my favorite things because we do not do that to songbirds. We're very gentle with them. Um, we've never gotten a clear answer besides that you don't want to be close to those raptors when you let them go. So you just toss them into the air. Um, so that's kind of counting. And then it also talked about banding, right? Um, so there's kind of two ways of banding. Like we can do uh, the metal bands, which are just uh, printed with a certain code um, where you have to actually recapture the bird to get its band again. Um, and then 
you can have kind of colored bands or auxiliary markers that actually through binoculars you can identify the individual birds. Um, so the auxiliary markers allow a whole bunch of people to be able to potentially be reciting your birds, whereas the metal bands means you have somebody has to physically recapture your bird. Um, the exception to that for metal bands is in like waterfowl because hunters are required if they shoot a bird with a band on it, that's not illegal in any way. Um, it, they just need to report the band so they can report it to the federal government that this is the band they got and where they um, shot it. Um, and that helps us understand where different wildlife, wild waterfowl populations are kind of going. So I would say hawk watching or like just counting and banding are kind of the oldest methods of tracking migration, right? Because they all, they count on any banding means you have to actually see the bird again, um, which makes it really hard especially when a lot of birds die on migration. So um, moving from that is something called a geolocator. So this is actually like a pretty simple piece of technology. It just uses light sensors um, and a clock to track day and night. So knowing the day length and the day and time that's happening gives you a GPS coordinate because as the bird is migrating, it's able to both, you know, sunrise and sunset are gonna be at a certain time based on where you are. Um, east-west and how long your day length is is how far north-south you are. So it takes some post-processing on a computer to get it, but it's basically going to give you a rough GPS coordinate. Um, the advantages of a geolocator are that they're very light, so they can be attached to really, really small birds. Um, this is a black pole warbler over here. Um, the disadvantages is that the data is actually stored on a chip that stays on the bird. So you have to recapture that bird to get your data. So we really only do this in areas where, and species that have really strong breeding season site fidelity, so that if you catch a bird on its breeding territory, you're pretty sure if it survives that next year, it's gonna come back to its exact same breeding territory or at least close by, so that you can go out and recapture it and get your basically computer chip off of it to do it. So people tend to you know, not get all of their geolocators back, but they do a pretty good job. Okay, so this, can you guys see the video screen now? It hasn't made any noise yet. I'm here at the Churchill Northern that? Study Center in Churchill, Manitoba, which is on the west coast of Hudson Bay in northern Canada. And my crew and I are here to place British Antarctic Survey uh, geolocation data loggers on the legs of Hudsonian godwits so that we can follow their migration over the next couple years uh, from here to the southern tip of South America. Uh, as fancy as a data logger sounds, it's actually this tiny machine. This machine weighs 1.4 grams, which is roughly the weight of a paper clip. This machine, when we attach it to the leg of the godwit, will subsequently uh, take the sunrise and sunset and timing of peak noon each day over the course of those two years and that will give us two uh, location positions every day and those will be the data that we use to plot out the migration of Hudsonian godwits. We're going to put that data logger just on a small little flag um, roughly the same size as the data logger and this will go onto the leg of the godwits. So once we've recaptured a godwit and taken the, uh, the data logger off of it, we need to hook it up to a computer so that we can download the data and then filter it onto a map and see where the godwits have been going over the past year. So we're going to go do that right now in the lab. All right, so we're in the lab here with the data logger from individual LP that we captured. So you can see that this data logger has been through some weathering and some salt and we've hooked it up to the computer already using um, this little black box that uh, the British Antarctic Survey has made for specifically this purpose and the first thing that pops up is all of this data. It's just a whole string of letters and numbers and to be completely honest with you I have absolutely no idea what those letters and numbers signify 
but each of these lines is 10 minutes of data. So the, the data logger takes a light reading every 10 minutes and it spews out 55,000 of these per year. So we've got that data already, so we've got all this raw data. And then the next thing we have to do is what's called transition editing. And what that does is this program takes all of that raw data and it reads out so that it shows us the light and dark cycles for each day from the last year. Finally though, after we, uh, we've gone through that entire process, we're left with this, our beautiful map of where Godwit LP went starting on June, um, June 22nd of last year and going through June 30th of this year. And if you are able to look closely here, you can see that it spent a whole lot of time here in Churchill, Manitoba last uh, June. And you can see that it spent quite a bit of time here at Churchill and then a bit more time here at James Bay. And then it flew all the way down here to uh, northern Argentina in the Buenos Aires province where it spent the winter uh, before flying nonstop back here to uh, northern Mexico. Spent a couple days there and then began moving up through the central U.S., stopping in Kansas and uh, somewhere in the Dakotas, and then again in uh, uh, Saskatchewan or Manitoba before finally returning here to Churchill uh, sometime in early June. So a pretty epic journey, all cataloged by this little machine. Okay, hold on. Just have to say that's freaking awesome. Right? That is so damn cool. The geolocator or that the bird does that? The, I mean, both. Like, it's just the fact that it's <laughs> yeah. tracking this, the migration cycle of the bird. It's, I don't know. I just. Yeah. It's pretty cool that people came up with this uh, in general. I mean, it seems like a crazy thing that then they catch the same exact bird up there again and get it off of it. But the data that it gets is, is insane. Um, really cool. <laughs> they must have put that thing on dozens and dozens of birds just to get that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's the thing, like, well, I'm going to talk a little, I think it's next about satellite ones. The nice thing about geolocators is that the individual unit is not crazy expensive so that you actually can put it on a bunch of birds and lose some of them on the way um, where you can't do that with like a satellite tag or something. Um, but yeah, pretty wild. So yeah, next one is satellite transmitters. So um, this uh, is great because you put this backpack on the bird and then it's gonna beam its locations back via satellite to your computer. Um, I make fun of people who do a lot of satellite telemetry because it's you're basically sitting in your armchair um, recording birds, but boy, are they still collecting data right now, even though no one can do their field work. So that's a pretty cool thing. <laughs> um, the, so the advantages are that you obtain all your data remotely and just gets sent to you once you get it on the bird. Um, the disadvantages are that these satellite tags are still pretty heavy, so they can only be used on pretty large birds who can still fly with um, a couple grams on them like that. But it gets data like this. Um, this is another Godwit, I think, um, but migrating over the Pacific, where it just gets like daily reads of where the bird is um, for sometimes multiple years. It can kind of track where the individual bird's going. Um, so that's that's a really cool thing. And you don't have to go recapture the bird because your data is getting beamed by satellite directly to your computer. Um, the unfortunate thing is that most of the time these, these transmitters never come off then. They get stuck on the bird for its life. Some of them do potentially fall off over time, but a lot of them are kind of left on the bird over time. Um, uh, another one that's kind of been up and coming but is uh, not perfect yet are these passive acoustic recorders. So these record um, 24 hours, like day, 
day in and day out, they're going to record because all they're doing is passively recording sounds as the birds fly over. So the advantages of this is that you can record birds flying at night where none of our traditional methods catch the birds that are migrating at night. Um, but the disadvantage is that the birds have to directly fly over and call as they're flying over. So a lot of birds do make little flight calls to keep in contact with other birds as they're migrating. Um, so usually they call, but you still could be missing a whole bunch if they don't happen to call as they're flying over. And then processing the data can be pretty hard too, because you have to know the specific flight calls and what they look like on a spectrogram and be able to tie that to a certain species. But you can collect a ton of data on a very long time scale without a lot of actual manpower out in the field. So this figure down on the bottom kind of shows you set up these big towers with these acoustic recorders, usually in pretty remote locations so you're not picking up other noises, and then leave it out for a year, go collect it, and um, see what birds were migrating over. All right, you're still seeing my screen, right? Okay. Um, another option for tracking is something called the MODIS system. Um, this is actually a network of towers um, that passively record tagged birds as they pass over. So you can kind of see on this um, figure here where the towers are located um, for the most part. So what they've tried to do is create kind of like at these pinch points, like across Florida here, um, they have a network of towers so that if any bird crosses through Florida, it's going to have to fly over one of these towers and get picked up. So the advantages of this is that the network is constantly growing. So um, I know there's two, like all the nonprofits up here have been putting up MODIS towers because it's kind of cool. You can like basically adopt a tower, put it up yourself, and then you know every migrating bird that's tagged that goes over you. So like Great Hollow has one, Connecticut Audubon has one, um, all these places have them so that they can kind of see, and then you feed into this greater um, ability to gain knowledge about migrating birds. Um, the disadvantage is that the, the towers themselves are the limiting point. So uh, my friend who runs Great Hollow up here, uh, he was so excited because he put geolocators on um, birds and they were migrating down and then a big hurricane hit Florida and knocked down all of the important modus towers for him um, And so he couldn't get the, the data didn't pick up the way it should have through Florida So that's kind of annoying and then you actually do have to catch the birds to attach the tags But you don't have to recatch them So they're picking up kind of remotely the data is going over the tower and you don't have to recatch the bird um, to be able to to get them I'm getting a real Real dog party over here. Hang on. Come here, bud. He really wants to say hi. <laughs> this is my my boyfriend's dog who just had surgery, so he's wearing a sweater to stop himself from licking his surgery. And he's very needy, so he might be giving the rest of the lecture with me. Um, so... Modus towers, right? So good and bad. I think we're going to see a lot more of them as time goes on <laughs> but, um, because the, the network is getting a lot better. So, I so it kind of seems like the most like effective way to go about this is like almost like human observations is like the cheapest, most effective way. It's to... definitely the cheapest, but not the most effective because think about some of those paths of um, the those birds that are flying out of the ocean we're never going to get information on them if we use just human observation so you need the satellites or the geolocators or even the modus towers because um, a lot of these birds like the birds flying over the modus towers are flying at an elevation that even a really good birder is not going to see them so um, that makes it hard <laughs> So yeah, no, there's, there's, it's not just humans anymore. But let me show you, this is kind of from the MODIS company. So they have their own uh, kind of trying to share. Birds have the power to touch our hearts with their beauty and songs, to surprise and fascinate us with their behavior, to inspire us with amazing feats of strength and endurance. 
Some songbirds migrate thousands of kilometers every year in challenging conditions. Birds play critical roles in our ecosystems. They pollinate plants and spread seeds. They help control insects. Birds are also valuable indicators of change. Many populations have been seriously declining for decades. One third of North American bird species need urgent conservation action to avoid extinction. We have to act now to protect the habitats and systems that support all life on Earth. But how? Scientists must unlock the mysteries of migratory birds and study their movements on breeding grounds, along migration routes, and in wintering areas. The MODIS Wildlife Tracking System uses tiny tracking devices and a network of hundreds of receiving stations strategically located throughout the Western Hemisphere. MODIS is yielding spectacular discoveries. Now, researchers can safely track bird movements over vast distances and with incredible detail to pinpoint the greatest threats to vulnerable species. The results help us identify conservation priorities and direct efforts and funds for maximum impact. Get involved today. You can help us conserve bird populations and habitats to ensure healthier environments for wildlife and for people. We have the power to make a big difference with your support. All right, back on my PowerPoint. Okay, so that's the MODIS thing. That's them trying to sell it. It did start in Canada, so that's why the focus is uh, Canada. Uh, Jenny, you got a question? I don't know if I missed it. Does MODIS stand for anything, or is that just what it's called? Oh, shoot. It does stand for something. I don't know what it is right now. Oh, okay. I'm pretty sure it stands for something, but I, I don't know. Um, Okay, um, so something that if we have time on Thursday, we'll talk more about is feather stable isotopes. Oh, um, he's, he's on like painkillers from his surgery, so I think he's just like very needy right now, this poor little dog. Um, I hope you guys can hear me okay. Um, so the cool thing about feathers is that they are, wherever the bird grew them is where they kind of get this uh, certain chemistry, right? So we can use stable isotopes um, to actually figure out the location where it was uh, grown. So if you catch a bird on its wintering ground, but it grew that feather at the end of its breeding season on its breeding ground, you can actually look at the isotope ratio in its feather and kind of geolocate it um, this is kind of more rough than a geolocator because um, you can kind of see here the bands of where stable hydrogen isotopes kind of go. But in general, we see this kind of geographic trend. And so you can have an idea of where this bird grew its feather. Um, and it's a pretty low stress thing. You just take the feather from the bird and analyze it. Um, so that it, that is kind of a, a really cool way of doing this as well. And what I've been seeing a lot is combination of feather isotopes and maybe a geolocator or a combination of feather isotopes and something else um, to kind of, I'm sorry, I'm really distracted. Can you guys see this? <laughs> okay, I'm back. Um, okay, and then the, the last one that we're gonna talk about today is using actual Doppler radar to track bird migration and this is what's kind of going on right now. So this is just weather stations that have radar over them have been forever picking up potential um, bird migration events because the same way it's tracking water droplets in the atmosphere, uh, those little birds kind of key, uh, kind of trigger their radar. So, um, get one more video to show you guys. Nope. During World War II, radar was developed as a tool for tracking enemy aircraft. 
However, radar operators reported unidentified angels or phantoms on their radar screens. People monitoring on the ground solved the riddle of the angels. They turned out to be flying birds. Early pioneers realized that radar could be used to study the flight behavior, movement, and ecology of flying animals like no other tool, and at enormous scales and distances. Aeroecology, the study of the ecology of life in the air, had always been a difficult and limited pursuit. Radar aeroecology became a new field of research in the 1950s and has grown ever since. More than 70 years after the development of radar, it is still one of the best techniques for studying aerial animals. Early researchers piggybacked on radar systems designed to monitor weather, air traffic control, or for defense. Today, researchers design systems specific to monitoring animal behavior and movement in the air. Radar aeroecology has helped scientists better understand the ecology of birds, bats, and flying insects, including migration behavior. We know that trillions of insects migrate across UK skies each year, and billions of birds cross North America each spring and autumn. Predicting bird migration, including events that could be harmful to aviation, changes in animal populations over time. Brazilian free-tailed bats migrate to Texas two weeks earlier than they did 20 years ago because of climate change. Conservation. Radar can let conservation biologists know how bird populations are attracted to light pollution. In 2012, the European Network for the Radar Surveillance of Animal Movement was established. And in 2019, a special issue of the journal Ecography is devoted to radar aeroecology, with contributions from the fields of aviation safety, computer science, conservation, ecology, meteorology, and radar technology. This issue is a landmark in the growing field of radar aeroecology and will help develop new partnerships and directions of research in this exciting new area of ecology. So radar, that's kind of the last one that we're going to talk about today um, and a really promising field. So you can actually go to this on your own time. So Cornell has something called BirdCast um, that is predicting every day uh, what the migration is happening in real time. So this I pulled down today. So this is right now our night migration. And so in the next couple of weeks, we're going to be able to track that the birds are coming towards us. Um, and so it's kind of cool because you can really get a good basically forecast of when the migrants are potentially passing over or going to get to you. Um, and since we all have plenty of free time now or stuck inside, I wanted to make sure you guys knew about it because I'm going to definitely be checking it um, so that you can go out and look for them in the morning once you start seeing the migrants kind of showing up here. Um, so what I want to do, uh, we're going to sign off as a group, but this paper is posted on Moodle. This is what I want to, I want you to read it now if you can, and then we'll talk about it more on Thursday with some more pointed questions. Um, but it's called High Intensity Urban Light Installation Dramatically Alters Nocturnal Bird Migration. I think it's going to be uh, very curious to you once you read what this high intensity urban light installation is. Um, it's something that once I started seeing talks about it, I'm obsessed with, um, and uh, I'm not going to say more than that. Um, so I want to talk more about it on Thursday. Right now, just read it over and make sure you understand what they're doing and what their main conclusions are. And then on Thursday, we'll kind of dive more into it um, with some questions and looking at the different graphs and things. So take a moment to download that. Does anyone have any other questions for me before I sign off? Do you have any questions for Buddy? I hope no. he's doing great. Oh, no, I think he's okay. Yes. He just needs extra love. Um, so thank you guys. Uh, have a good day, and I'll see you guys on Thursday. See you, Professor. Thank Bye. you. Take care.